Bring that forward some, Greg. <laughs> That's your guys' books everywhere. You. <laughs> All right. Okay. You guys ready? Yep. 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 Here we go. I'm Scott Rouse, my body language expert and analyst, and I train law enforcement in the military in interrogation and body language. And I, I don't know, I get the giggles. I'm so sorry. Okay. Uh, right. What do they call that, Mark? Corpsing? Corpsing. For no reason. There's nothing. Yeah. Going. I'm Scott Rouse, my body language expert and analyst, and I train. <laughs> I'm Scott Rouse. Wait, 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 sorry, Greg. I'm Scott Rouse. I'm, yeah, yeah, okay. I'm, I'm Scott just make Rouse. you laugh it out. That's how you do it when you're on stage. Is when you're rehearsing, just I'm laugh Scott it Rouse out. And so is my dog. Yeah. Oh, here we go. I'm Scott Rouse, my body language expert and analyst, and I train law enforcement in the military in interrogation and body language. And I created the number one online body language course, BodyLanguageTactics.com, with Greg Hartley. Mark. Mm -hmm. I'm Mark Bowden. I'm an expert in human behavior and body language, help people all over the world to stand out, win trust, gain credibility every time they communicate, including some of the leaders of the G7. Chase. I'm Chase Hughes. I'm a behavioral expert. Did 20 years in the U.S. military. Now I teach intelligence agencies and the general public in persuasion, interrogation, and behavioral profiling. Greg. I'm Greg Hartley. I'm a former Army interrogator, interrogation instructor, resistance to interrogation instructor. I've written 10 books on body language and behavior. Also put together this number one online body language course with Scott, bodylanguagetactics.com. And I spend most of my time on Wall Street or in corporate America. All right. Well, today we're going to talk about Chris Watts. He's the guy that's in prison right now for killing his pregnant wife and his two little daughters. And uh, this has been one that the panelists have been asking for right and left. We've got a whole lot of requests to do this. So that's why we're going to do it. And go ahead and subscribe. Now that you're here, we're just we're firing up. Go ahead and hit subscribe. That way you'll know when we have a new uh, show come out. All right, you guys ready? Go. Yep. Let's go. Uh, Chris Watts, W-A-T-T-S. Wow. What, what's going on right now around your house? Right now it's got K-9 units, the sheriff's department. Everybody's like they're... They're doing their best right now to figure out, like, if they can get a scent and see where they went. If they went on foot, they went in a car, or they went somewhere. And right now, it's just like they've they've been on point. They're going through the house trying to get a scent, and hopefully they can pick something up to where it's, it's going to lead to something. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so, look, obviously we know that he committed the crime. He's doing time for this. He... Um, you know, we, we know that. So what is the point of watching a video like this? Well, I think the interesting thing is for you is you'll see examples of these type of videos come up a great deal while somebody goes to the media and says, hey, you know, find these people. And you'll often look at those and go, hang on, is, is something going on here? Why don't we give you some of the things that we can see that may well indicate what was going on at the time? What do we got? He does an eyebrow raise on his own name. Now, that's not an indicator of somebody lying, but it's kind of interesting that saying his own name, he, he already wants some buy-in on something which is total fact at this point. We know this is Chris Watts. The, the interviewer knows it's Chris Watts. Why that moment of recognition of buy-in? So notable there. Um, he's already bound up here we can already see he's bound up he, there's no way his hands are coming away at the moment to do any kind of descriptor and we've already got this pacifier gesture or movement of the kind of side to side stuff that's going on already so already quite notable what's going on there eyebrow raised at the end there on to something so we want some kind of buy-in on the idea of of something, but he's not naming any of the possibilities at this point. Early days in this interview, but I think already some mo some notable elements. Most notable for me is the raise of the eyebrows on his own name. Scott, what do you got? Right. Well, we see that really strong eye contact just right out of the gate. Like you said, uh, Mark, his arms already crossed. He's already in that adapter phase of holding on to himself. And he's doing what Greg and I refer to uh, as romancer. There's a thing we that we've come up with that, that that's called strip, and that's where it's we have um, 
the ways that a person being deceptive will engage with the person that's asking them the questions or, or the person they're talking to. And strip stands for stancer, trancer, romancer, uh, insulator, and prancer. And in this case, I won't go through all the definitions of them, but in this case, we're seeing what's called the romancer. And that's where they dead eye with you. And it's like, yeah, they, they, they lock eyes with you and they pay attention. They're close. They're right on you as they're talking to you. So they can make sure you believe what they're saying. And if anything looks even just a little bit of a hint of wrong, they can start adding uh, qualifiers to that. He doesn't start his swaying until he says to see where they went. And that's when he's talking about the, the dogs and the, and the, and the cops. So that's when he starts the, the, the swaying. Now here in the beginning, we, you, if you just saw this at the beginning, you haven't seen the full in, um, interview, then you couldn't say, ah, oh, that shows deception because we don't know it yet. That could be part of his baseline as you go along. So until you have all that information, which we'll have by the end of this, we can't say that is, is indicative of someone being de deceptive or he is. But in this case, we have to take that into consideration. You keep that information when you see this these big body language move, movements happening. In his forehead, we see little or no movement in his eyebrow or his forehead, in his brow area. And something that's this emotion should be this emotionally charged, we're seeing nothing. We see nothing, not much eyebrow movement at all, except uh, one of the parts where Mark was talking about where eyes is, is brow went up when he, when, they, when he said his name. So this is one of those things where we'll start tracking this because throughout this, we'll see the hallmarks of a psychopath as we go through this. At the same time, we'll be gathering this information to see that he's being deceptive about all this. So remember, right out of the gate, you can't, this is where absolutists are created where they say, oh, I know now and he does this, that means they're lying. It doesn't mean they're lying or being deceptive. You have to watch and remember as you go down, the questions happen. He only does this when he's talking about his family and that situation, that's when he starts rocking back and forth. Otherwise, he's just straight ahead. He's just standing there straight. So that's what I've got for that. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, so let's talk for a minute about baseline because I've watched this guy. There's actually another video of him before he gets in trouble in 2012 talking about how to maintain a strong relationship and not screw around on your wife and that kind of thing. Irony, whatever. But he, what we notice is this is kind of an adapter for him. This I call it chained elephant, shifting weight from the right to left legs. Politicians do it when they're uncomfortable until they're coached. What we'll notice is that that will change frequency. It will get faster and maybe even shorter and faster as he gets more stressed. That's an adapter and a way to release nervous energy. It's a way of making the uncomfortable comfortable. That's all it is. So we talk a lot about fight or flight on here. So let me talk for about 30 seconds on what fight or flight is. Your brain is pretty simple. It's there to protect your body, the body being the most important thing to the brain at the moment when you're in, in a bind. So the amygdala, what happens when you first get stimulus is the thalamus in your, in your little brain sends a signal to the neocortex to say, hey, here's this thing going on. And at the same time, sends that signal down to the amygdala. And there's one on each side of your head and one's more responsible for positive memory, one for negative memory. But it gets the first vote because that's why we're still alive, is if it mistakes a bear for a rock, you don't reproduce. If it mistakes a rock for a bear, well then, so what? And so the amygdala gets first vote and it decides whether you go into fight or flight and whether you run away. That's quite simply it. And then it dumps hormones through the adrenal cortex and other parts of your body to start getting you ready to fight. And when it gets you ready to fight, it does a handful of things. It takes blood away from your skin, and it leaves it pale, takes blood away from your digestive and reproductive system, so mucous membranes dry up, and there's signals to each of those running down vagus nerves and that that affect your body. And then, of course, your blink rate increases because your eyes are dry and your eyelids are trying to wet them. And those are all things you can see from the outside. Now, it also causes you to try to make yourself comfortable because you're uncomfortable. Pupils dilate. There's other things that you really don't care about when you're watching somebody like their bladder expands so they don't know they have to urinate and that kind of thing. But all of those pieces are tied to your autonomic nervous system and are there to protect the organism and make you get out of the way or fight back. We we're just joking about fighting earlier. There's an interesting piece. What it does to you is turn off your thinking brain. That neocortex now doesn't matter, so the amygdala is running the show. And it will start taking away that brain. And what's telling about this guy, and you're going to see it starting right now, is when that happens, you lose language because that neocortex is your language friend. And when we talk about things like, Mark, you call them filler words, those can also become adapters like, 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 uh, 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 
And when you run out of words, you start trying to make sense out of what you were saying. And we're going to see that a lot. So we're going to see him sway more. We're going to see his blink rate increase. We're going to see a bunch of things happen, but the words start clustering for those and you'll find where he's starting to tell you lies. A few interesting things. He does show grief, almost a micro expression, just for a second there. But it's not profound. It's not what I expect when my wife and kids are missing. And he does a hard eye contact for persuasion. And then my favorite, he's talking about a dog being in the house getting a scent. When the dog barks, watch his blink rate. It's amazing to watch. Then he goes into a slight smile of helplessness. And the way you can see that smile of helplessness is the forehead has concern. The eyes are large because they're afraid. And you get that weird little smile. Those three things are not good indicators together. Now, we can't tell what's going on inside his head, of course, because we are not mind readers. We're reading symptoms. What I think is going on is because now we know he killed his wife and kids, he's afraid of being discovered. Could there be a reason for him to have a smile of terror, discomfort, or fear because his wife's missing? Sure. But we'll see a lot more of these clusters, and I'll bring this up over and over and over as we see more of it. Chase, what do you got? Yeah, going with no context whatsoever. His uh, behavioral table of element scores a 12. But the, the definitive study on this was done by Yardley, Wilson, and Lines. And they classified family killers or people who killed their families into four categories. The first one is self-righteous. Then we have disappointed, anomic. And finally, we have paranoid. The self-righteous is usually concerned with suffering, will torture younger people in front of the, the mom in order to maximize suffering. Here we have a disappointed case where his life is not satisfying with them anymore. So I'm just going to delete that part and start my life again. Anomic is mostly concerned with economic income. It's associated with my family. And finally, the paranoid part is people who are thinking I need to, to kill in order to protect them. And that's, that's specifically to, uh, from the president from the police, from the CPS workers, or from aliens, no matter what it is, that would be that part. They need to go away. The only way that they're going to be protected is if they're dead. But right here, we have the dissatisfaction, this uh, disappointed mindset here. I think it's interesting to just take note of that, knowing that with hindsight, as we look at the, the next few clips. Cool. Uh, Chris Watts. W-A-T-T-S. Wow. What, what's going on right now around your house? Right now it's got K-9 units, the sheriff's department. Everybody's like they're they're doing their best right now to figure out like if they can get a scent and see where they went. If they went on foot, they went in a car, they went somewhere. And right now it's just like they've they've been on point. They're going through the house trying to get a scent and hopefully they can pick something up to where it's it's going to lead to something. All right, we good. Right. All right. What happened? Your wife came home. Tell me, tell me, tell me what's, what's she, like, she came home from the airport 2 a.m. and I left around 5.15. She was still here. And like about 12.10 in that afternoon, her friend Nicole showed up at the door. Like I had texted Shanann a few times that day, called her, say, you know, but she never got back to me, but she wasn't getting back to any of her people as well. And that's what really concerned a lot of people is like she's not getting back to her like if she doesn't get back to me that's fine like she gets busy during the day but she can get back to her people which was very concerning and nicole called me when she was at the door and that's when i came home and then walked in the house and nothing has vanished nothing was here i mean she wasn't she wasn't here the kids weren't here no nobody was here all right greg what do you got yeah so i'm gonna be a little long-winded here because really if you can't see this guy's brain is not in gear you really are missing the boat. Word choice, right? Anytime you're talking about people you love and you talk about, you use words like nothing was here. Not my family was not here. Um, and the choices of words, other people or many people were, a lot of people was a word. A lot of people were concerned. Well, how about you? You know, if I were interviewing him, I would ask a few questions. Of course he wasn't. So anyway, you're starting to see the compounding of fight or flight in him. See that tongue jut out? His lips are dry. He's trying to wet his lips. And you make all that a grooming or, an, or, or some other kind of gesture. Or it could just be his lips are dry and it's just he's starting to feel the impacts of this. He's rocking more. 
His arms are tightening. We call these barriers when somebody puts their, and just because you put your arms in front of you doesn't mean anything. But most of the time when somebody is feeling threatened, they will put their arms in front of them and their hands will be free so they can get them loose and do something with them. If you're comfortable, you may cross your arms and just bunch your hands in. So just crossing your arms means nothing. But when you cross your arms and you're hugging your body and you're rocking, now it's starting to catch up with them. So I'm going to coin a phrase here for him. We'll call it his sway rate instead of his blink rate. How's that? <laughs> and we'll, we'll, we'll look at his sway rate as we go forward. He also has increased respiration as he gets to a lot of people. And you'll hear him scramble for words as he gets to it. When he says a lot of people, then, oh, oh, it's no big deal. Here's cadence shift when he says, no big deal that she wasn't talking to me, but her friends. Click, click, click. He fills that in very quickly. Too much information. Then what, And that's when I came home. Okay, where were you before that? Why, what were you doing would have been my question there. And then he says, and the dog bark. Watch his respiration when that dog barks again. I love this part of this entire video because I'm not sure if that's the police dog, but we all know that those dogs bark when they identify like body fluids or that kind of stuff on the floor. So I could hear him doing that. Um, another word, poor word choice was nothing. And then he realizes he raises one shoulder and he fills in the blanks again. Guys, progressively everything we look at reduced illustrators no illustrators except for when he's talking about the the friend coming over the sway frequency is increasing his respirations increasing fight or flight everywhere he's screaming fight or flight uh chase what do you got right after the person the interviewer says what happened i want you to take a look because the video is about to play you'll see a smile and it's horrifying when I took a look at it, it is horrifying. There's an actual smile there. And then it's, this is before he starts answering, there's a sharp kind of a hidden inhale, a lip lick, a single shoulder shrug and a head shake, which before he starts answering his deception score is a 16. This is not counting Greg's quote, chained elephant uh, movements here or his sway rate. <laughs> and when he says, uh, it was 5.15. His eyes move up to 12 o'clock to recall a time. And then when he says 12.10, the eyes shoot up to the 10 o'clock position. And I think this is his deception area. So I want you to keep this in mind. When his eyes move to like the 9 or 10 o'clock area, for the next few videos, take a look at what he's saying when the eyes move to that exact position walked in the house and he's describing the house there's a sudden complete absence of pronouns while he's going through this entire thing which is even more deceptive here but guess what he does when he's talking about walking into the house his eyes move to 10 o'clock and this is his baseline for deception in less than 40 seconds we've got this uh mark Chase, let me add one thing to it. Watch his eyes. Here's the thing. Regardless of what you think of eye movement, when people are thinking, their eyes go somewhere. If he's telling the truth this time, he's not going to be telling the truth next time because he's changing up. Watch his eyes. Mark. So let me put myself in his shoes. Now, obviously, I'm, I'm not him. We're not the same person. We can't govern or judge other people's behaviors by our own. But it is, you know, sometimes an interesting starting point to start thinking about the behaviors that you see going, well, but what would I do in that situation? If it were me, I wouldn't want to be bound up like, well, this is kind of what we're seeing at the moment in that shot, bound up like this, because I'd want my illustrators out there because I'd be wanting to describe to the interviewer, look, here's what happened. And because the better picture I can create for that audience, the more likely it's going to be that something will trigger in their mind and they'll go, hey, I, I saw something or or I, I think I might have some information for you because, you know, I want my my kids and my wife back. So my illustrators would be would be out there. I'd also be leaning forward into the story. I wouldn't be bound up and trying to keep away from the story. Yeah, I'd be, I'd be, if I were doing any rocking motion, I'd be wanting to rock forward into this story rather than rock side to side around it. I'd also want to be mentioning the names of people and their relationship 
to me. I'd be wanting to say, you know, my wife's name, my kid's name, and, and that relationship, wife, my kids. He's not mentioning names, or and certainly in the case of the wife, he doesn't seem to be describing anything of the relationship. And then for me, he minimizes and distances, almost negates by saying, nothing was here. That for me is the biggest red flag there, that use of the vocabulary of nothing was here. Then we see he goes back to correct himself and try and attach human beings and relationships to things, but it's a bit late by then. Would you ever say, say to an interviewer, you know, I went to, when you're talking about your wife and your kids, okay, or any, any solid relationship, important relationship, yeah, I went in and nothing was there. They're not things, they're human beings. And again, so for me, it starts to flag, okay, that's kind of interesting that he's seeing these, these people as um, objects, essentially, and not relational to him. Might be an insight into the personality that we have here. Scott, what do you got? All right. Well, we see him lick his lips as he comes into this, and he's still doing that, that thing with his mouth where it's like this. A lot of people are going to think that's stress mouth. It's not yet. It's going to be later on. But right now, he's still working his way up. His lim limbic system has been triggered, so we're slowly seeing the stress build and build and build. Now, what he's doing in this case, when you when you have a – I used to have a little a – it looked really cool, too, a really like a mustache and a little beard thing because I can't grow it out here. It just looks horrible. You know, I look like a hobo or something, even when I'm in full beard. So when you get that, you start doing this all the time. And you start goofing around with little hairs there, and you pull on with your teeth and stuff. That's what he's doing. That's a habit. That's a little tick he's got right there. But at the same time, it's become an adapter. So as he's talking, to, as, as he's being asked these questions, he's using that adapter as he's thinking. And the whole time he's waiting here, as, he, as he's, waiting for, he's waiting for these questions to be asked, he's waiting for the bombshell question. He's waiting for him to really come in strong on him. And so every time it, it isn't, you, so you almost seem relaxed a little bit as he moves forward into in the answer to that. So that's just an adapter at this point. We don't see stress mouth. However, it does look, it's starting to look like it. When he's, again, let's take into consideration what we saw in the last video, the big swaying and stuff. It almost stops here. It almost stops, not completely. As he goes back and forth, as he's talking about the facts, when he's talking about the girl coming over or where the situation was, when he starts talking about facts, that's when he starts slowing down. But then it increases when he starts talking about the wife and kids. And that tells us there's an issue there. And if you pay close attention to it, you'll see, you'll, you'll see this, this behavior goes in our pile of deception cues that we've seen so far. That we don't, we don't know for sure they are so far, a, a few of them that, we, that we've already seen, because we haven't seen enough to be able to tell yet, because there are no absolutes. But pretending we haven't seen this yet, we, we, we'll just say those look, kind of, those look questionable. And we see those quite often when something like that happens. Then we have his blink rate. It's still slow. It's 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 not. It flutters a, a couple of times, but nothing big, nothing major to go. Oh, look, he's got you know, his eyes are fluttering because of this, that, or the other thing. We don't see enough of it yet, and his eye contact is still is still tight. He's still in that romancer groove that he's got going with this guy, trying to pay attention, making sure that the guy believes him and that everything is, is sounds the way it should because he's rehearsed this thing. He's rehearsed it in here. He has, but I'm sure he's told this story quite often. So he's got, so far, he's got a pretty good handle on how that story should go. But keep in mind, when he, when he starts talking about facts, he slows the swaying down. But at the same time, when he does, he starts talking faster. Things speed up when he starts talking about the facts, when he's, what, the things that really happened. When he starts talking about talking to somebody on the phone, the girl came over, she did this, and he starts talking faster. Probably just to get that out of the way because he, he doesn't need to think about that. So his baseline, I'm thinking, is probably a little faster than when he usually talks. But at this point, he's talking slower so he can pay attention to everything he says. All of these things we're seeing indicate, they denote, they suggest that he's heading into not limbic overload, but his limbic system is really firing up here. And he's really trying to keep it under control and trying to look cool. The only thing that's really bad on him is the swaying. And his sway rate is pretty much the same right now, but it's it's going. And we see it the whole time, except for when he's talking about or relaying facts, things that actually happened. What happened? Uh, she, like, she came home from the airport 2 a.m. and I left around 5.15. She was still here. And 
like about 12, 10. And that afternoon, her friend Nicole showed up at the door. Like I had texted Shanann a few times that day, called her, say, you know, but she never got back to me, but she wasn't getting back to any of her people as well. And that's what really concerned a lot of people is like, if she's not getting back to her, like if she doesn't get back to me, that's fine. Like she gets busy during the day, but she didn't get back to her people, which was very concerning. And Nicole called me when she was at the door and that's when I came home and then walked in the house and nothing was vanished. Nothing was here. I mean, she wasn't, she wasn't here. The kids weren't here. No, nope, nobody was here. All right, we good. Yep. Will you be posting those pictures of you with the moustache so actual panelists can decide if it did look cool? Because you just yeah. saying it looked cool, that's, you know, that's not evidence. So how many times did you try calling her? I called her three times, texted her about three times just to say, you know, what's going on? Like, I did, I, cause after, after, the, after I called her and texted her once, it was like, I, Maybe she was just busy, like she had just gotten back, you know, like everybody's probably calling her from her trip. She just got back from Arizona and I figured just, she was just busy. But when her friend showed up, that's what it was like, it, it registered like, all right, this isn't right. All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, so I, I told you, listen for his brain to go out of gear, trying to scramble as his body is trying to take over and get away. Like, 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 six likes because they're asking him something hard. And Chase, you're dead on. When he's going over here, he's using his brain in one way. When you ask him questions about how many times he called or texted, I'm sure he did that as a cover. His eyes go over here. He goes to a different part of his brain. So he's going to a different place for recall than he was going earlier. So, okay, does it mean that he is lying about something? Yeah, I mean, with 90% likelihood he's lying about something, he's just a different part of his brain, his eyes are moving. And people can tell you that eye movement doesn't matter. It does. When a person's moving around in their head to new places for a piece of information they should be recovering from the same place, there's an indicator. There's a baseline deviation. That's what you're after. Doesn't mean I know what he's thinking. It means I'm going to ask that next question. He's sucking on that facial hair thing, you know, in a kind of a grooming adapter move. He does request for approval when he says, I called her about three times. He raises his brow, waiting for approval and with a confirming glance. Um, and then his sway rate is up now. He, you're dead on earlier, Scott. When he's telling the truth or when he's stating facts, his illustrators come up, his sway rate slows, and his speech pattern comes up. So all that stuff comes up. He's got six, six, um, six likes. He um, is looking around and he blink, blink, blinks, and then makes hard eye contact again back into Romancer. And that's plenty for me. I don't think there's, you know, this thing is so full. We'll all have plenty to talk about. Scott, what do you got? All right. Um, again, we are seeing that that mouth adapter. It's not stress mouth yet, but we're getting close. It's, it's going to happen a little bit later on. Now, we got to keep in mind this swaying thing we're seeing. This is again, I want to say one more time, this is how absolutists are born when they see something to go, I that person's swaying back and forth. So that means they're lying. Remember, we saw it in the in that video on Chris Watts. So that's not what we're saying here. That's not what's happening. It just happens to be part of what's going on. Having said that up to this point, we can say this is now showing us uh, it can be seen as a, a deception cue because of, of the way things have changed. When he's talking about his family, we would have noticed that he was swaying back and forth when he was talking about anything else. He's talking about what are facts that we know that we know are true already, not knowing his story. That's when he straightens up and, sl and slows down. So that that behavior of the back and forth thing is not an absolute. Let's keep that in mind now. Something I found very interesting was a micro expression. When he says she had just gotten back, that did you see that part of his mouth go up? And that denotes and indicates disdain or contempt for her. Later on, we're going to find out that he had what he calls an emotional discussion with her. As we know now from his, when he confessed, they got in a fight about the, their relationship. And it was a, that's when everything went sideways and he ended up killing her. It's hard, it's tough to notice that when you're talking to someone like that, but you try to keep those things in mind when you see that. You can't run back and say, what did he say when you're doing this live? So you have to go back and watch video at that point if you're an investigator or an interrogator. You have to look at it in, in, from that point of view, from that perspective. I've got to take some time out and go look at this because I think this is what I saw. When he touches his, his face with his finger right there during that lie, that's an adapter writ large. They don't get much bigger than that. We could bang, it comes up and does that number. Wow, because he's right in the middle of the lie at that point. 
all these things now that we've seen in the, in the in the past during these videos leading up to this are now we can start considering those as deception cues and we can start putting those in the pile of deception because we know which ones to put in the pile of the truth because we know the girl came over she, they know she called they know she came over all those things they can suss those out fairly quickly so yeah that did happen but right here we can put those other ones all over here in the deception pile and it's starting to grow okay chase what do you got so we had uh, some lip retraction immediately. So we're starting to see, I want you to pay attention to this. There's, we'll talk about it in a second, but a lot of his deception indicators are piling up before he starts answering. So before he gets to answer, as he's realizing the nature of the question that's coming along, I think he doesn't realize that he is being judged before he starts answering. I think in his mind, the moment he starts speaking is when he needs to be on. And right here, I'm surprised Greg and Scott didn't say it. This is a textbook, perfect example of fading facts, ah, as, as you guys like to call it. it. Yeah. So it, the volume starts up here and ends out down here. So he starts the conversation and it just kind of trails off into the end. And he says, after I called and texted once with an eyebrow flash, a no head shaking, a single sided shoulder shrug, facial touching, both shoulder shrugs and eyes moving to that lie spot that we talked about earlier, which is 10, which is a 22 on the behavioral table of elements. And keep in mind, you just need an 11 to be judged as likely deceptive. He says, Friend showed up, his eyes moved towards the front door of his house, which is over there. So this is just a physical reference. I don't think it is an eye movement uh, whatsoever. And after his statement, if you're wanting to know when to look for blink rate for deception, it typically about 60, 70 percent of the time is after someone starts or after someone finishes a statement, they're done talking to you. And now they're really nervous about whether or not you're going to accept it or whether or not you bought it. That's all I got. Mark? Yeah, good. Uh, okay, yeah, exactly. Contempt, disdain, a little bit of anger as well in the in the canine there on, as you said, Scott, she just got back. I think it starts around she was busy, and then she just got back, and it, and it grows over that. And then he gives it again on trip as well. So, you know, it, it red flags for me. There is something around getting back from that trip or the trip itself and as Scott brought up there's this idea of an argument uh, you know after that so you know good signal there uh, yeah that's that's all I got on on that one you know I think this is a really good one for us to bat around because what you just said Scott and what everybody is saying here the absolutist would say he scratched his nose he's lying okay well yeah. he touched his face there's an adapter doing this, increasing sway rate, doing this, increasing blink rate. We're looking for clusters, guys. Mm -hmm. This guy is wrapped up in clusters of behavior that indicate yeah. something in his little noggin is on fire right now. He's stressed. And that's what we're looking for. We, we don't know what, but we now we know because we know what he did. But if we were talking to this guy, we would all be digging into him pretty hard right now. Yeah. yeah. And I'll throw one thing in here too. When he's talking about she didn't answer my calls or texts, and that's fine. I think he is explaining character that is missing. I think he's mm -hmm. explaining and offering some self-control and nice guymanship that is not there. Hmm. That's good. good one. Okay. No. Good All one. right. So how many times did you try calling her? I called her three times, texted her about three times just to say, you know, What's going on? Like I did, I could after that for the after I called her and texted her once. It was like, right, maybe she was just busy. Like it, she just got back, you know. Like everybody's probably calling her from her trip. She just got back from Arizona, and I figured just she was just busy. But when her friend showed up, that's what it was like. It it registered like, all right, this isn't right. We good? Yep. yep. She just took off, do you think? I, I mean, right now, I don't even want to just like throw anything out there. Like, I hope that she's somewhere safe right now and with the kids. But I mean, could she event? Could she just taken off? I don't know. But if somebody has her and they're not safe, like, I want them back now. 
Like that, that, that's what's in my head. Like if they're safe right now, they're going to come back. But if they're not safe right now, that's what, that's the not knowing part. Like if they're not safe, I, I, last night I was, I had every light in the house on. I was hoping that I would just get, just ran over by the kids running in the door and just like barrel rushing me, but it didn't happen. And it was just a traumatic night trying to be here. All right, Chase, what do you got? Uh, we've got my favorite here, failure to make reasonable assumptions about events and suspects. And this is on the Reed Interrogation Manual, page 65, quote, it is natural to think about possible motives, perpetrators, or causes of events. Guilty people are going to be much more afraid to eliminate things from the pool, to eliminate suspects and potentialities from the pool. That's why we're not hearing him say the names of his kids, the names of his wife, the names of his friends, the location she could have gone. We want to make the pool as wide as possible. You need to search everywhere. I don't even know where to start. Uh, does he like to ask himself questions? Yes. Yes, he does. This is another thing that is a deviation uh, from his baseline. And he's exhibiting something that medically is called nystagmus here. In psychology uh, terms, this is called a transderivational search where he's, his brain is trying to access his file clerk, is running around as fast as possible trying to access information. And this is processing. It's very akin. It's the closest you can be to being fully in trance when you're completely awake. And uh, he's looking for data. And his story centers around his grief, his anguish not a desire to recover the family. He said it was a traumatic night for him. That was an honest statement. You could see his swaying start to slow down as he was talking about how traumatic it was for him. And the, the second identifier that it was a traumatic night for me, you can see his lips remained open after the statement. I'll pass it up to you, Greg. Yeah, so great call out. When you look at, there, there are many studies that show this now, but when you look at guilty 911 callers, they don't try to get help. They tell you the story. He's telling you the story. I mean, this is not a 911 call, but he's telling you the story. And it has nothing to do with these poor kids. It has to do with how he felt. If he were really smart, he would shut up once he talked about the kids and, and just go cold. Because what he's doing is showing you what he does when he's telling the truth by illustrating with his hands when he's talking about how bad his night was. And then when he's talking about these kids... So this guy is a piece of work. He says, I hope, and it's the first time you see a grief muscle, I hope that she's somewhere safe or words to that effect, and the eye blocks. Only time I see the grief muscle, he knows that she's not safe at this point. There's the asymmetric smile. You would call it, Mark, uncovering the canine. We know that anytime you've got the asymmetric expression on your face, it's disgust or contempt or some of that. And when he's talking about his wife, it's there. And then he almost assaults her character. Could she have abandoned? And then he, it's like he's alluding to the fact maybe the kids aren't with her. I hope they're together and they're safe. But if they're not, so there's a whole lot of stuff going on in his head. I think he's trying to figure out what to say to make sure that when things go wrong and he gets in a bind, something will come back and he'll have something to use. But he, he is very, he's illustrating very clearly, a little bit of voice fry, but he's illustrating very clearly, clearly how he felt. Um, and then he uses like in this one seven times, a very short clip. So we know his little brain is scrambling like a squirrel in the road trying to figure out which way to go. And his frontal lobe is not working, not sure how well it works when he is. But we also know, again, I'll go back to this rocking. We know by watching a baseline of him trying to deliver a class for one of the courses he was taking at a college that when he's uncomfortable, he does the, sh the shift. So his sway rate's up and we see all of that going. Um, Mark. Yeah. So again, if it were me, um, you know, I would be worried, worried that people, are, that my wife and kids are missing. Um, I would want to throw a lot of stuff around, throw a lot of options out there, you know? And he says, I don't want to throw anything. <laughs> out there and when he says i don't want to throw you know anything out there we see that canine come up uh yes uh disgust disdain contempt anger 
elements of, of, of those possibly in there. Um, the swinging from side to side has gone up. Now, we, we, we've got to critically think some of the, the, the swinging. Understand by putting his arms here, he's raised his centre of gravity. Um, so, so, you know, anybody could swing. If they, put the, if, they put their, if they put their hands high enough and try and stand still, the body will start, start swinging. But this is pronounced enough that clearly there is some tension in the legs that has to be uh, exercised in some way. And because he can't get off and walk anywhere, he can't leave the interview, he's only left with this pendulum device going on. Uh, one notable thing as well, watching, really watching the reaction of the interviewer. Eyes dead set on that interviewer to work out how's that person responding to my story. And here we start as well, for him to be framed as the victim here. He had a traumatic night. So poor me, had a traumatic night. He starts to put himself in that narrative as a, as a victim there. So again, uh, we'll feel empathy for him. We'll feel sorry for him. Our heart will go out to him. And that should dull our critical thinking around some of the discrepancies in the story or the behaviours that he's giving out here. Scott, what do you got? Uh, <clears throat> on this one, I'm not going to be able to, uh, I'm disgusted. So I'm not going to be able to approach this from a non-emotional uh, perspective and use foul language. So I'm going to pass on this one. Do you think she just took off? Do you think? I, I mean, right now, I don't even want to just like throw anything out there. Like, I hope that she's somewhere safe right now and with the kids. But I mean, could she have Could she just taken off? I don't know. But if somebody has her and they're not safe like i want them back now like that that that's what's in my head like if they're safe right now they're going to come back but if they're not safe right now that's what that's the not knowing part like if they're not safe I, I, last night i was I had every light in the house on i was hoping that i would just get just ran over by the kids running in the door and just like barrel rushing me but it didn't happen and it was just a traumatic night trying to be here all right, we good? Yep. I'm gonna ask some kind of tough questions about your relationship with your kids. Yeah, every, every, I mean, yeah, my, my kids are my life. I mean, those those smiles light up my life. And this, like, I mean, last night, like, during, like, at, you know, when they usually eat dinner, it was just like, I miss them. Like, I mean, I miss telling them, hey, you gotta eat that or you're gonna, not gonna get your dessert, you know? And just like, you're not gonna get your snack after. I, I miss that. Like, I, I miss them, you know, cuddle up on their couches. They have like a Minnie Mouse couch and a Sophia couch that they cuddle up on and watch, you know, Bubba Guppies or something. And it was just like, you know, I, I, I was, it was tearing, tearing me apart last night and I needed that. I needed that last night. And for, that, for nobody to be here last night and to go into their rooms and, not, and know that I wasn't gonna turn the rain machines on and I know that I wasn't gonna turn their monitor on. No, I wasn't gonna kiss them to bed tonight. It was, it, it was, I, I, that's why last night was just horrible. I couldn't do it. it. I just, I just want, I want everybody to just come home. Like wherever they're at, come home. That's what I want. All right, I'll go first on this one. Um, we're seeing that mouth habit again, and now it has turned into stress mouth at this point because he's hanging on to it there, and you can see him pressing down. You can see his lips pressing together there, and he's prepping again. He's prepping for the question. He's waiting for that bomb to drop. It never drops, so he's so that's almost a, re a relief for him. Then he gets into this explosion of flowers and glitter about how he loves his children and his unquestionable love about and all the little things they do, and he smiles the entire time. Now a normal human. What at this point, if they're going to cry or show any emotion whatsoever, if their eyebrows are going to start, if their brow is going to be pulled together in the middle, if they're going to start showing some grief right here in their mouth, their chin or the forehead, this would be the place in a normal human. Again, as we've gone along here, we've seen all the things that show us we're dealing with a psychopath, not all of them, but a whole lot of them. No emotion here whatsoever. Still talking like a robot, still not showing any emotion at all. His eyebrows, and it's not from Botox, his eyebrows aren't moving much at all. And again, we see nothing that shows us any grief whatsoever. Now, he's talking about his children. That's the whole thing is based on what his, his children, how much he misses them. And it's all supposed to be focused on him. 
in 64 seconds, this guy says, I 27 times. Now, if you listen to it, he says something really quickly, but you count them. I did. I went through this thing about five or six times to make sure I was right on that. 27 times he says the word I, showing no emotion whatsoever, smiling the whole time. And it's not even a real smile. What he's done here, as psychopaths will, will do, is they'll, they'll be under the impression they should be smiling during something to show, oh, I just miss them so much. And the smile should be real if he was going to do that. We see no hallmarks of a real smile. When you, he's, is, he's doing the smile in, in, in impression of a smile. But when he's smiling, his, these parts of his mouth don't go in deep enough. They don't indent. When you really smile, your brain is the one that pulls those parts of your mouth in. So this part of your mouth comes forward and it, it, it deepens it in there, makes these big dents in there. And the same thing for the eyes. You don't see, this is the obicularis oculi right here. And when you squint, and he didn't even try to squint, when you squint, when you're smiling, that makes these things wrinkle on the side, but they don't wrinkle the right way because it's not your brain doing that, you're doing that. These facial muscles and this fake part right here is pushing up the obicularis oculi, which is pushing those up and makes it squint. What happens in real life when you really, as Duchesne de Bologna, noted is when they when they really smile and their eyes go on the side like that and make those little wrinkles it comes down like this it doesn't go up like this it comes down like this because it's happening from the inside it's pulling those not pushing on those and by the inside i mean the brain now the last thing he says is that's what i want that's what i after you, that's the 27th i in there and then there's a full seven seconds of stress mouth just standing there doing that as he starts to begin that little sway part again. So that I think at this point, we can feel pretty good that we're dealing with someone we would question about whether they were a normal human or might be a little bit headed towards psychopathy in this. Personally, having seen so many of them and dealt with so many of them, I would go ahead and say, man, we need to watch out. I think this guy's a psychopath. But clinically, you can't tell sometimes for six months to six months to a year. But in this case, I think we're seeing enough here to go ahead and say, wow, this isn't good at all especially since we already know the outcome where he's killed him. And we can look at him and say, there's no emotion there anywhere. Still talking like a robot and doing the mistaken impression of trying to smile when he's supposed to be sad and smiling. He didn't put that together when he's, as when he's seen someone else smile during their sadness, he thought it was just smiling. And psychopaths will do that because they don't understand emotions because they have none, they have no empathy. So what they'll do is they'll see your emotion and they'll remember that and they'll copy it as they go out with their friends or people they hang out with and show them that emotion. So that person will never question whether or not they have emotions or not. They'll take you the emotion they see on you or someone else and they'll just copy it and show it to someone else. That's how they look like they have emotions. He's, he's not even doing a good job at it. I can't believe the guy talking to him that say, and this is, this is getting weird. Why are you acting this way? Didn't call him on it because that shouldn't be a real smile. It's not, but he shouldn't be trying to make a real smile. He should be sad and smile at the same time. Chase, what do you got? Well said. 100% agree. I think there's some uh, malignant narcissistic uh, traits Oof. in there, for sure. In the first three seconds, we have a hard swallow, lip retraction, eye blocking, and an escape glance, which I don't think we've mentioned here before. This is a horizontal aversion of the gaze where the skull and eyes move both. So the eyes move and the skull starts to follow it. This is searching for an exit or an escape glance or escape gaze. The word like is coming into play 700% more than his baseline. I spent an hour watching this piece of human on YouTube today, his uh, YouTube videos. Uh, communicates uncertainty and is this is a linguistic tool. He's using the word like as a unconsciously as a linguistic tool to create vagueness with the hope that vagueness will create some understanding in the long run. It'll be easier to relate to because I'm not certain about this stuff. Not one single team pronoun here in a statement. Like Scott said, he doesn't say we would do this. I miss I miss them. We would all do this, us. We need us back together. He did all the parenting according to his stories. He didn't say we would turn on their noise machines. We would put them to bed. We would be watching a movie together. 
and he finalizes his statement with eye blocking blink rate at 93 per minute. Granted, somebody might say there's a TV camera around, which might make him a little more nervous. The average TV camera blink rate when someone's on television is 21. Greg. Yeah. So a couple of things. Well, I agree with you. He's using like, I think that he's just a roach with when the lights come on, when he uses the word like, I don't think that anything's in there. I think this is just his brain going tick, 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 and trying to fill in blanks. And that's his word, right? If he used a word like chicken, then he would be saying chicken seven times, whatever it is, because he can't think of the right word. He's just going to roll something off of his tongue. And if you watch his video, even when he was teaching this course, he has filler words all the time because he, when he's uncomfortable, he does that. So, Mark, you talk about peach all the time. Let me talk for a minute about horses. Horses have this thing called weaving, and it's considered a vice. If you have a horse who has the weaving vice, you have to say, hey, this horse weaves because it wears their joints out, and they do this. And what you notice in a horse is that they do it when they're nervous. And the more nervous they get, the shorter the stroke and the more frequent it becomes. Watch what's happening. He's not swaying as smoothly. It's getting to be more frequent and shorter stroke. So interesting to watch the effects of stress on his brain, and you're seeing it, and you're, Chase, you're hitting dead on. I, I call it oblique angling, that escape, that look away. It's the guy in the standing with looking at his watch, looking past his watch to the bus that you were joking around with. It's yeah. that move, trying to get away, get that head out of the way. So, you know, don't leave with your jaw. I, I have it on my notes as well. The only time he was really illustrating is he did say, I want them back. I'm sure he's thinking, what did I do? Not because he feels for them, because I don't think he has any feelings, but because he realizes this is going to come to an ugly end for him. I think he can see that with all those dogs in there. You watch his barriers get tighter. His blink rate just goes through the roof there at the end because he realizes that this thing is tightening in, and we're going to hear harder and harder questions as this goes. I can't say I feel any sorry, any sorrow for him. Guys, if you wonder why we giggle about things like this, it's because comeuppance is a good thing for this guy. And so watching him do something stupid and get look like a worm on a griddle doesn't bother any of us. It's just the way it is. And that's where we're at. Is that everybody? Or? Mark. Mark, yeah, I gotta go. yeah, Mark. Yeah. Um, so he's being torn apart. So he so he says last night he was getting torn apart and, and he needed his kids. He said, I needed that. I needed that. So uh, to Chase's point, what we have there are some examples of, of narcissism where, where the others in his life are there in order to feed his well-being, his emotional well-being, or, he, or, or his practical uh, well-being. Yes, if it's malignant narcissism and he's psychopathic, it's a really, really bad combination, the kind of combination that could potentially commit the kind of uh, act uh, that he did in the end, which is, if you know about that, it's 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 pretty out there. Uh, I'm okay. So he says, I miss them. An optimist would say, I'm missing them right now. He says, I miss them. That has a finality for me. That even if I didn't know the outcome, I would be going. Why is he not have hope? right now what i've experienced with others in similar positions but not the bad actors uh in 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 this situation is they tend to have they hang on to an optimism whether it's something religious or just a general optimism they tend to form words around that he doesn't seems very final um and then, yeah, so, so frames himself very much, again, as the victim here, with everybody else being part of holding him together and his well-being. The finality of, I miss them. And then, uh, I think as Scott was saying, we get this long lip compression at the end, which is nothing like we've seen before on, I want uh, everyone to come home. Huge lip compression on that. There, that's what I got on that one. Excellent. I'm going to ask some kind of tough questions about your relationship with your kids. Yeah, every, every, I mean, yeah, my, my kids are my life. I mean, those those smiles light up my life. And there's like, I mean, last night, like, during, like, at, you know, when they usually eat dinner, it was just like, I miss them. Like, I mean, I miss telling them, hey, 
you got to eat that or you're not going to get your dessert, you know, and just like you're not going to get your snack after. I miss that. Like I, I miss them, you know, cuddle up on their couches. They have like a Minnie Mouse couch and a Sophia couch that they cuddle up on and watch, you know, Bubble Guppies or something. And it was just like, you know, I mean, I, I, I was, it was tearing, tearing me apart last night and I needed that. I needed that last night. And for that, for nobody to be here last night and to go into their rooms and not and know that I wasn't going to turn the rain machines on. And I know that I wasn't going to turn their monitor on. I know I wasn't going to kiss them to bed tonight. It was, it, it was, I, I, that's why last night it was just horrible. I couldn't do it. it. I just, I just want, I want everybody to just come home. Like wherever they're at, come home. That's what I want. All right. We good? Yep. Hello. No, this might be a tough question, but did, did you guys get into an argument before she left? It wasn't. It wasn't like an argument. We had an emotional conversation, but I'll leave it at that. But it's. I just want them back. <laughs> I just. I just want them to come back. And if. If they're not safe right now, that's what's. That's what's tearing me apart. Because, if they are safe, they're coming back. But if they're not. This 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 has got to stop. Like somebody has to come forward. You spoke to her family, like her parents. Yeah, I've, I've, they've been in constant contact, like every hour. I mean, it's I mean everybody back in North Carolina and the East Coast. I mean, from Maine to Florida. All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so this is the first time we see uh, a fuller shot, so we can actually see that he's protecting uh, one of his joints here. So it's not. You know, because it could be could be cold, couldn't he? Could be cold. It's, he's, he's raised his center of gravity, and so yeah, no, but it's not. He's he's protecting a joint here, which suggests to me under stress. Um, what kind of sings out to me in this is the pleasant look he has all the way through this. It's not quite a smile. It's just pleasant. It's just a pleasant day for him right now. And that is, for me, totally incongruent. Totally incongruent with this. He, he remains with that pleasant air on his face, gentle smile uh, all the way through. Very incongruous. Uh, again, he goes for, uh, it's, it's tearing me apart, frames himself as the victim, and then uh, this has got to stop. Well, the this that he's talking about, because he doesn't know, you know, uh, if, if, if the story were a story where he's not the perpetrator, he doesn't know what's happened to them. And he's come up with no solutions as to it. So he doesn't know. So the this can't be what he imagines is happening. It has to be his own state. This has got to stop. So now I think we're seeing the tension and pressure that he's under, under and he wants this to stop for him. Again, that is a, a relatively narcissistic trait, even if, even if he weren't the perpetrator and there were the possibility that they've been abducted, um, the, 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 the wife has run off with the kids, taken them away, um, whatever it might be, you possibly wouldn't say, well, this has got to stop because the focus wouldn't be on you, it would be on them. And there is no focus at the moment on them, their state, their potential state, their safety. There's nothing around that. And for that reason, it, if I were seeing this fresh and this had just come up on the news, alarm bells would be going off for me because I'd be going, why do you care so much about yourself and not them? in this particular situation. Chase, what do you got? Most of his nervous behaviors we're starting to see more now are anticipatory in nature and anticipation. And in my career, I don't know how many thousands of hours I've, I've been doing this. I've noticed this is a lot more common in people involved with sports and athletes. Uh, you can even go back to the OJ Simpson uh, interrogation uh, I think the detective's name was John Van Adder. And you can watch those tapes and watch him being questioned or, or, or deposed. You can see the same thing. You see it with a lot of athletes. There's some digital flexion, finally, finally. 
Right in the pinky. Excellent. <laughs> right in the pinky. So that digital flexion is a stress response. And if we're breaking body language down, I have to teach you body language in three seconds. The body's either closing or opening. That's how I would teach it to you. So we see that digital flexion. The fingers are pulling in towards the palm. And it's great. It's right there on, on his arm. And I, I wrote down here, Mark taught me this. Uh, we were having a glass of wine or something yeah. somewhere. Yeah. Mark taught me this thing about the joints. And I've started to see it in a lot more places than I thought I would. And I truly believe it. And I think when he says, I want them back, he's more concerned with the rapport with the interviewer than anything else. So that's what he's done his whole life is mimic and build rapport and build trust with people. So he defaults to that script or that narrative that is just programmed in him. And this is common in guilty people because innocent people are more likely to open the floodgates no matter what. It's guilt or shame, or anger, or sadness. They're a lot more willing to open this stuff up. This is research from a guy named Vrij. I think everybody here has seen his name. I think it was 1999. And uh, continues to make no mention of these people's names, which is Shannon, Bella, and Cece. I hope you guys remember it, because I won't say this guy's name. Uh, I'll pass it to you, Greg. Yeah, so there's. I used to say to my kid, every morning I wake up a monkey, every night I hope to go to bed a human. There's a lot of monkey in us, a lot of behavior patterns that emulate apes. And one of those is nervous smiles, that when you're in a bind and you go, hey, chimps show their teeth when they're nervous or terrified. And when we're not cognizant of what we're doing, we can do all kinds of weird things with our face. And if you, I think Ekman said there were 19 smiles and the smiles the most complex of all human communication. If I'm wrong, you guys write it down below. But I, I think I recall that being correct. It's been a while. And you see here this face that's connected in some weird way, an awkward kind of a smile that doesn't fit. And there's still asymmetry in the smile all at the same time. He's signaling all kinds of confused things. And Scott, I know you're going to wrap this part really good because you're going to tell everybody why he's doing that. But he just, he's asked a question, did you argue with your wife? And that question's clear. It's coming across the bow. What would you say if you didn't? No, no, we didn't. You wouldn't say we had an emotional discussion. Uh, okay, that's softening whatever happened. Right there, I'd want to dig in if I'm talking to this guy because he's head, he's hiding and hedging something. He distances, then he get, does that little weird nervous smile again. And every one of you has made a mistake in your life, done something that didn't feel like a mistake when you were doing it, you wanted to do it, and then you got busted and you all did that weird little smile too. It's how when we ask a question in interrogation and someone laughs, we know they did it. They may not realize they're doing a laugh or a smile. It's a nervous release. He does that. So we're paying attention to that. That's asymmetric signaling. And then this barrier gets tighter. And Mark, I appreciate that covering the joints piece. I also think he's keeping that hand free, right? Mm -hmm. it, no one is going to trap their hands if they're under high threat. So we're seeing that. And then let's leave it with words that he says. It wasn't like an argument. It was an emotional conversation. But I'll leave it at that. That means I'm not talking about that anymore. And then he goes into this weird logic thing I won't cover again about if they're safe, then I, I didn't even follow it. It's so squirrely. It's just about they're dead and I know it. And if they're safe, they're safe. If they're not, they're not. So, Scott, you want to wrap up his behavior? Yes. Yeah. Let me start here, though. I can't believe none of y'all said this. When I say it, you go, oh, my God, because Chase nailed us on one of these earlier and usually i'm checking these off because i have to do a bunch of them because by the time it gets to me they're all gone he opens up with chaff and redirect he does because he says yeah because he says uh we had an emotional conversation i'll leave it at that then he starts talking about all this other stuff and the guy just goes down that hole with him i can't believe any of you guys said that <laughs> i just got it i complained and you went back to it uh, greg i was like well that's cute it's your chaff and redirect is something is one of your terms. So I figure, well, here it comes. I get rid of that one. <laughs> so anyway, that's what we're seeing is this, is this chaff and redirect. But when he said that, when he said we had an emotional conversation, I'll leave it at that. That's when he should have pulled the Dr. Phil and climbed right on up in that colon and let him have it. Because that the door, pardon the pun, is wide open at, at that point. He can say, well, hold on just a minute. Man. What, what are you talking about? Where are we going with this? What do you what do you mean you had an emotional conversation? What is it? But he doesn't. He said, oh, okay, I just lets him go on. 
mind blowing how easy that was. And I think the reason that we're seeing that that weird smile is because again, he doesn't know what emotion to use. He's seen somebody use the smile as they're sad, trying to go, you know, I just am trying to get through this horror and, you know, trying to that kind of thing. But he doesn't know how to do it. He's doing it wrong. So that's why we're seeing those all that weird confusion on his face. He's seen people do it and he's tried to do it earlier and he's trying to do it one more time. So that's why I th that's why I think it looks so confusing at, at that point. Then he says, I just want them back. <laughs> Like, are you kidding me? Really? It's it's unbelievable, unbelievable how how lame that was, and the the interviewer let him get away with it. Now that might not be the, the interviewer, the the news guy from TV, you know, the the guy who goes out, the reporter who gets the story. He may have said, "Go ask him these questions and bring it back, and we'll edit it together." Maybe in a situation like that. But if this guy is any kind of of interviewer, he should be ashamed of himself for not stopping it right then and going, "Hey, man." You, you know, we got to get into this. You, we, so hold on, everybody check this out. Should have really gotten up his, his hind end on that one. And um, it's that, it, and then that same, going back again to wrap that thing up, that we're seeing the confusion because he doesn't know how to give the, the correct or proper uh, emotion in this situation. He thinks he does, but he's doing it wrong, in other words. And, uh, this might be a tough question, but it did you guys get into an argument before she left? It wasn't, it wasn't like an argument. We had an emotional conversation, but I'll leave it at that. But it's, I just want them back. <laughs> I, just, I just want them to come back. And if, if they're not safe right now, that's what's, that's what's tearing me apart. Because if they are safe, they're coming back. But if they're not, this, this, this has got to stop. Like somebody has to come forward. You spoke to her family, like her parents? Yeah, I've, I've, they've been in constant contact. Like every hour i mean it's i mean everybody back in north carolina and the east coast i mean from maine to florida right we good yep yep florida. what is her parents saying to you like, they're just like like if they need to get on a flight just let them know because i mean they don't they, they feel helpless right now because they, they're on the opposite side of the country i mean this colorado is i mean you can't just drive around and look i mean it's just like you wouldn't really know what you're looking for. That's what the cops pretty much told me. That, that first day, I was like, I want to get out and drive around. They said, you wouldn't know what to look for. Um, All right. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, so just a couple of things. Remember, we talked about the sway rate. It's not slowed. It's constrained. So he's moving. He does a request for approval, raises his forehead when he's telling you why he didn't go out and look because the cops told him he wouldn't know what he was looking for. His blink rate's up, and that's all I got. Um, Scott, what do you got? All right. The, the sway, like you just said, the swaying stops almost completely because he's relaying facts. Yep. He's talking about what happened there. So it's, he's not worried. He's not got his family on his mind and not, doesn't have that set of information that he's been spewing out earlier that he has to worry about or pay attention to or that's, that's making his stress level go through the roof. Um, and going back from the very beginning up to this point, we've seen when he's talking about family, when he's talking about things that happened, when he's talking about the, what the police did or what people are doing, then he's, he's stopped swaying. He just stands there as he's talking. We see his illustrators get bigger, a lot larger. Usually when someone's being deceptive, you'll see the, the illustrators, as we've seen throughout this, this, these videos, come to a halt almost as he may be moving back and forth. The illustrators are the things you use to, your brain emphasizes specific words and phrases like I did just then. And so now he's at swinging his hand around, making a slapping noise on his elbow and going to the joint thing you guys were talking about. You'll also people, see people, um, cover their their knuckles and their fingers this way with the other hand. It does expose these, but they are covering them. Is an adapter, and they're also most of the time squeezing. But you'll see that as well when it comes to um, covering joints. And that's why then they rub their legs. It'll be on their knees. Those uh, those style of, of coverings. All right, uh, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so uh, biggest one for me is the big swallow on the mention of the parents. So I think the parents are a threat in this situation. If the parents actually said, you know, fly down, sure, come come on over. But hey, you, you know, the police are telling me you wouldn't even know what to look for. There's just really no point. Because I guess the parents are a big threat here in that they would potentially not give up. They would search longer and longer. They would uncover more. They would be able to get into the relationship. So I think, you know, big swallow there on the parents is, is indicative there of there is a bigger threat uh, in his mind with them. Uh, Chase, what do you got? This little, you know what, didn't even have time to start a GoFundMe before any of this stuff. 
which some of them do. <laughs> I think it's interesting. He's, uh, he's finding it easier to use his hands to gesture and talk about stuff because he's mostly telling the truth here. Um, so there's three phases a person does. They commit a crime. They go through three phases before they talk to the police most of the time. This is rationalization, projection, and denial planning. And this is from me. But the rationalization, I've, I did this because the projection... These are all the reasons. This is who could be responsible, the environment, my childhood, society, social media, all this other stuff, and then denial planning. Now I'm going to kind of craft a story or figure out, you know, I'm just going to rehearse saying I didn't do it on the car, in the car on the way to the police station. So you kind of go through those three phases, and you see that he's in this third phase. He's already got to this, this third phase already. He's got his denials planned out. And I think a, a lot of what we're seeing here, keep in mind, we talk about how this stuff is very tactical and calculated, made to make a, another person feel a certain way. It's unconscious. He, he's not, he doesn't have some mastermind uh, playbook on how to control human emotion. An idiot could do some of this stuff because he's been doing it since he was young. I just wanted to put that out there, that this is not a smart person. It's a person who has these innate skills, mostly due to a lack of emotion. What is her parents saying to you? Like, They're just like, like, if they need to get on a flight, just let them know. Because, I mean, they don't, they, they feel helpless right now because they, they're on the opposite side of the country. I mean, this Colorado is, I mean, you can't just drive around and look. I mean, it's just like, you wouldn't really know what you're looking for. That's what the cops pretty much told me. That, that first day, I was like, I want to get out and drive around. They said, you won't know what to look for. Um, okay, we good? Yep. Questions. Uh, what is what is law enforcement? What have, what have the police or the sheriffs or your neighbors? Is anybody? What is what's, what's police saying to you? Right now, this is what they're doing right now is with the canines in the sense. I think this is the biggest thing. This is the biggest thing they've done so far because yesterday they all federal police department did all the searching of the house and try to gather whatever information they could and with the detectives, officers, and sergeants. And today it's, uh, I mean, obviously with all the activity that's around, it's, 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 there's a lot going on around here. And I really hope that all of this can lead to something positive. All right. Uh, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, so Chase, when you're talking about why people lie, whatever they make up, whatever cause, they also have to think about how they're actually going to deliver the lie. And so Scott and I talk about a trigger. The trigger in this case is he killed his wife and family. So he had to start making up details already. And he knows where he's got strong or weak story. And you don't have to be smart to know that. If you say, hey, I went to work today and I went to this place, they might go there and check it. So he's trying to avoid all of that. And that's a, that's a style of avoidance. We talk about lies of omission. So he's had a trigger. He's fabricated what he wants to talk about. And he's deconflicted. He's not going to talk about work. He's not going to talk about anything. And every time he gets the chance... When he's pitching, he's gonna when he's telling his lie, he's, he's gonna redirect and get away from it. And that's what he does here. When they're asking questions about what the police are doing, that's a rambling bunch of nothing. He has riveted eye contact. He's back Scott in Romancer from what we talk about in true crime. His blink rate is up and he's licking his lips. He also is doing kind of that drawn back, Mark, you'll talk about bitter taste in somebody's mouth, disgust. And his swallow, he's swallowing pretty heavy. He's back to some facts because he jumped off the thing about his family and he's now talking, he's now jumped off and he's talking about something else entirely in this entire thing. I hope that something positive can come out of this. Well, if I were missing my wife and my kids, I would know what the positive thing I want to happen is. And I would be somebody help me find my wife and kids. He knows that's not possible. So he's hedging. And I think you're right, Chase. He's not the sharpest tool in the in the drawer. So that's the way it is. Um, Chase, what do you got? Yeah, so I think it's a non-answer to begin with, which is deceptive in its own. Uh, he, the interviewer asked, what are the police saying? And he talks about what the police are doing. And we have three categories of that deceptive behavior can fall into. And this is preparatory, delivery, and review. Like at the review phase, 
I'm looking, did you believe me? I'm assessing what I said. I'm planning what's going to happen next. And if you want to see it at the very beginning of this, as he realizes what the question is about, blink rate is over 100. We've been waiting for an example of this on the behavior panel. So the panelists finally get a chance to see what it looks like over 100 blink rate. Uh, also lip licking in preparation phase, more deceptive, hard swallow. I hope this leads to something positive, which is his innocence is what he's thinking about. And uh, his answer, his entire answer is like a mental thesaurus. Like we have this and this and this, and here's another word for it. And they're doing this and here's another word for that and another word for that. So he's just trying to give out as much information as he can uh, to sound smart, well-informed, who the hell knows? I don't give a crap. Uh, Scott. Okay. All right. So as he's, um, again, we see, we, we hear that swallow. It's audible. You can go gold as he swallows because they're starting to talk about the sheriffs and the police department, and law, law enforcement, and that's making him nervous. So we're seeing that limbic system. It's, it's, it's not worn out. But at this point, it's been through so much. He's kind of relaxed for a minute. Then he starts talking about that stuff and he stiffens up again. Uh, again, he's waiting on that possible bombshell to be dropped on him, but it never happens. He's still waiting for that for him to, to doctor fill him one time and get up and start trouble with him. Um, no swaying, not his sway rate is dang zero, not nothing, not even a little bit, because he's just talking facts. His illustrators get huge at this point, just swinging around, talking, throwing his hands around, and he's just relaying information about what the police are doing. So it's low stress for him. And again, Looking at all the footage of the lying, you know, comparing the lying and telling the truth, uh, he's lying when he's moving around a lot, when he's when, when he's talking about his family, because that stress builds up and he starts tightening up that grip. And then when he starts relaying facts, when he opens, like Chess, uh, Chase says, it's you're either closing or you're opening, opens right up and is like, hey, it's like Frank's not welcome. You know, he, he just opens right up and starts talking. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so uh, absolutely, Chase, like blink rate goes off the charts uh, at that point. And, and just as you said, Scott, audible gulp. I mean, it comes over the mic clear and positive. I think he's under a lot of pressure and stress right now because he starts in, and Greg, you'll like this, he starts into this jibber jabber. It's just a torrent of nonsense before he finds his form again and he really hits um, a list, essentially. He's able to give a list of law enforcement that have that have come round and he's got it all there he says it's any names hierarchy so what he's trying to do is go <clears throat> look at the list of people that are here look how important they are so he says canines detectives officers sergeants like we've got them all we've got them all and they're all in there and you know there's a lot going on he says around here and that he hopes something positive comes out of it and he looks away from the house and off. My guess is he's trying to put down that hierarchy of police to go, look, there's a lot happening here. If there were anything to find, they'd be finding it right now. And really the positive thing is, is they should all clear out and go and search elsewhere and get out of where the hot spot might be which is not necessarily the house. I think it's him. It's the concentration on him right now that is the big uh, pressure. Uh, so, yeah, you know, he really does name everybody involved in law enforcement there. Uh, and, uh, and well done that he managed to form some words in the end as a shopping list of law enforcement, uh, even to the dogs. Uh, that's all I got on that one. Excellent. Questions. Uh, what is what is law enforcement? What are, what are the police or the sheriffs or your neighbors? Is anybody what is what's, what's police saying to you? Right now, this is what they're doing right now is with the canines in the sense. I think this is the biggest thing. This is the biggest thing they've done so far because yesterday they all the federal police department did all the searching of the house and try to gather whatever information they could, and with the detectives, officers, and sergeants. And today it's. I mean, obviously, with all the activity that's around, it's, 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 there's a lot going on around here. And I really hope that all of this can lead to something positive. All right, let's move along. My last question, if you have any, though, is a something. My last question is, if your wife can see this, if she, if she can watch these, what would you, what would you 
What would you like to tell your wife and your kids? Shanann, Bella, Celeste, if you're out there, just, just just come back. Like, if somebody has her, just please bring her back. I need to see everybody. I need to see everybody again. This house is not complete with without anybody here. Please bring her back. All right, Chase, what do you got? Just in the prep, we talked about how he's more deceptive in preparation phase. He has object insertion, hygienic gesture, blink rate up to 69. Before he even answers his question, his score is a 12. <laughs> Interesting. He has a hard eye block as he's saying, I need to see everybody. Because I think he's envisioning seeing them where they are at that time, in that moment. Just my opinion. Uh, his repetition is unconscious, and he's trying to reaffirm that he means it. So people will typically unconsciously repeat a phrase to reaffirm to themselves that they mean that phrase. And when he says, anybody, uh, please call home, or, you know, there's nothing there. He's just saying anybody who has her, not like, hey, you guys, please call call me, send me a text message, just reached out, just please let me know you're safe. Uh, let me know the girls are safe. And it, it's just, just this is uh, incredible. And it finishes up with some hardcore lip retraction at the end there, which which we all saw. And anything going, just as a quick lesson for the, for the panelists, something passes the barrier of the teeth, most of the time, that means it is a need for reassurance. Uh, Greg. Yeah, I won't go into a whole lot here. I think, guys, by this point, we've seen the sway rate, the, all this stuff. You can see when he's lying. What's more interesting to me in this is just how quickly he's off her and to somebody else. I mean, when what would you say to her? And he says, Shanann, he goes down, lists their names, and then said, I got to see you. But then he goes to third person. If anybody out there has her. I need to see them. It, it, just the words, I'm not complete without anybody in the house. That's just weird words to talk about somebody that you love and your life revolves around. Now, you might be angry with your wife, you might, but your children, you would not, even if you think your wife ran off with your children, you'd be like, bring my babies back, whatever it is. I don't care how hard you are, your kids or your kids or your kids, unless you're something is off in there and you're thinking of them differently but shifting quickly to that third person person pronouns chase you always hit the pronouns when he starts talking about if they and somebody else and that distancing from her that quickly is my first red flag and i'll drop at that and hand it to scott all right um when he says why that's when the stress begins to build again because that's when he starts going back and forth and then but when he says if you're out there if you're out there come back come on man when you're when when he asks this, when he's every person you see that that is that if I said to you, let me let me pose this question to, to the person watching. If I were to ask you this, show me the face you'd make and the expressions you'd make if you're asking someone to return your kidnapped husband, your kidnapped wife, your kidnapped child, they would say this. Please, their eyebrows would go up and say, please bring my child back. I, I'm hoping you'll do whatever it is. And that, that's what that's what they would say. In reality, those people that do that are the ones that don't have those that don't know that emotion either. That's why their eyebrows go up. What they would do is come down and say, please bring my child back. They're making a command to them on the way out. Please bring my child back. And you would see this in here. Like I've got there, you'd see that brow uh, come, to, come together there, knitting of the brow. You don't see any movement up there in this guy at all. Again, when something which was, which is an emotional situation of the utmost emotions would be coming out here he wouldn't even see eyebrow movement we got nothing on this guy you know you what would you say you know to have him come back tell the person to have him come back well it just talks like a robot everything's just just straight but remember that woman who who um put her kids in the van and then ran it off in the lake and said oh somebody killed my yep. you know carjacked me at the red light what was her name does anyone remember Susan something right south carolina i think it was yeah. susan okay. harris i can't remember yeah that might be right. So if you watch that thing where she's asking her the, the guy to bring her kids back, she's doing this. Her eyebrows are up. 
everybody in her family, their eyebrows are down like this because they're trying to say, they're thinking about what they would see, what she, she would say. You can see that that's one of the first cues or tips that made those police officers, the detectives go, Hey man, something's up over here. You know, I knew it. I totally, because she's not doing this, she's doing this. I just want to. And they use words like I just want, and I just, and we just, but they should be down, not up like that. So this is just a lame attempt at pretending to ask whoever it is that might have his kids and his wife, his pregnant wife, as a matter of fact, to bring him back. So it's just, just lame at that point. Mark, what do you got? Uh, yeah, so as we've heard before, he's making himself the center of this. He's casting himself as the victim. I need, I need. It's all about what he wants. Uh, just as everybody said there, there's that moment of if. There's no optimism in it. You know, if you're out there. Yeah, no, look, I, I'm, I, I really hope you're out there. I really, there's no hope. There's no positivity there. The biggest thing for me is when the interviewer is when the interview go interview, interview goes down and the interviewer comes to collect the mic we see his head move away now maybe the interviewer has got into close proximity we can understand that he might want to move his head away from there again if it were me i'd be looking the interviewer right in the eyes as they take off the mic and i'd be saying so look when is this going out when what time does this go out how often will it who's whose show is it going to go on is there is there a way we can do another one of these like is there do you know anybody else who could like i'd be asking for more help i'd be saying thanks so much for for doing that politeness would be up the need for more engagement would be up uh nothing it's like he's done. It's like I'm 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 done with this. There is a slight hint. Maybe it's me projecting, because I'm I don't think I see it in the in the face. I don't think so. But I do get a sense of of again disdain for this interview. It's something that he shouldn't have to be doing. And I think if you were truly in that position, you would be going, I I'll, I'll do as many of these as is necessary. Like do you want to do another one? Have you got everything that you need? Yeah, we don't see any of that. There, that's what I got. My last question, if you have any, though, so feel free to set them. My last question is, if your wife can see this, if she, if she can watch this, what would, you, what would you like to tell your wife and your kids? Shannon, Bella, Celeste, if you're out there, just, just, just come back. Like, if somebody has her, just please bring her back. I need to see everybody. I need to see everybody again. This house is not complete with, without anybody here. Please bring it back. So look, the, the thing is, if, you, if you're watching uh, interviews like this and you see them go on, you know, be really careful because you can't tell from any one little moment if somebody's a perpetrator or lying, but hopefully we've shown you some of the signals that you can look out for that might lead you closer to the truth of what's really going on here. So watch out for them. I agree. Yeah, yeah. Look for clusters. Look for all this to change. Look for deviation around certain kinds of story. And, and hopefully if the person's a criminal and they're as stupid as he is and they'll stand up and give you all the signals when they're telling the truth so you can tell when they're not. When he's using facts and using his hands and open, to your point, Chase, I love that, open and closed. He's open when he's giving facts that you know are true. Those are control questions and interrogation. And then when he goes to things that you don't know about, he closes up and does the sway thing. So he, he gives us a baseline. It's a great thing. Yeah. And as we went through here, you saw from video one, two, three, four, five, we saw these things happen over and over and over. And we could tell when he was being honest and when he was being deceptive. That shows you there are no absolutes. You can't just say because he's swaying, that means he's lying. You can't say because he's doing with his, this with his mouth, that's not a deception or a, a cue for deception. None of these things in and of themselves by themselves mean squat. But when you start putting them together and you remember what happened when you used to do in the older videos that's coming up and you're still doing them, that's how you put these things together. So when someone tells you every time you see this, it means they're being deceptive now that's not what it is all right why don't we throw it around the room and, and kind of give our percentages of deception mark you want to go first uh yeah i mean i think it's interesting i loved hearing from everybody this this 
difference between the the sway on deception and how it softens out during uh, truth telling. Um, I mean, look, hindsight is we know he's being almost utterly deceptive uh, throughout. So it's a tough one to to throw out a number because because we know the reality of it. Awful case. Um, you know, maybe we'll have something brighter and lighter next week for you. Maybe not. I don't know. Uh, Chase, what do you think? What, what percentage you got? Yeah. Chase, what percentage you got? Uh, we know he's 100. And uh, I think prison is way too good of a place for this guy. Yeah. However, uh, maybe we can do something next week. Maybe another really juicy alien abduction or something for you guys. Oh, yeah. sure. Greg, what are you giving percentage wise? Yeah. Okay. He did. Did he tell any truth? Yeah. Cause we could tell, we could tell from baseline, but that was not his story. That was just his ability to fill while he was thinking up details. So when it comes to his story, lie, lie, flat lie, nothing good came out of his mouth. He used truth only in a way to manipulate the interviewer. So I'm with you hundred percent bad guy done. I hope we don't see him again. Yeah, Scott, you yeah. want to wrap it up? Hey, I'm with you guys too. That's all we saw. The only time he was telling the truth is when he was telling who came over and who made a phone call and how the parents felt and what the police were doing. That was it. That wasn't part of his story. So if we take just his story into consideration, I give it hundred percent as well. hundred percent lying. That's a deceptive. That's a psychopath. Every card I have, every chip I have, I put it over on the psychopath side for that guy. All right. Please subscribe. And hit the little bell so you know when we have a new video come out. They always come out on Thursdays, if not before. If I get them uh, edited before on Wednesdays, they'll be out. So we'll see you next time. Thanks so much, guys. Bye. Well, thanks. The Behavior Panel. All right. Okay. You guys cool. ready? Yep. 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 Here we go. I'm Scott Rouse, my body language expert and analyst, and I train law enforcement in the military in interrogation and body language. And I, I don't know I get to to giggles, but I'm so sorry. Okay. <laughs> Uh, we said, I don't know, I guess, I don't know, I guess, I don't know.